Okay, so the paper I'll be presenting today is called Learning Transferable Visual Models from Natural Language Supervision. And colloquially, this is referred to as CLIP. Now, this is a paper which was recently published by OpenAI. And honestly, it's super fascinating, super cool. And by the end of this presentation, I hope I would have convinced you like just how awesome it actually is. Okay, so before I get started, just a bit of who am I, because I know now we've got members from Sheffield and Kings here as well. So it'd be nice to, to get to know you guys a little bit and vice versa. So I'm a second year PhD student at Imperial College and my primary research is in visual question generation, but I have interests in variational models and generative models as well. I'm a dog person, but I've, I decided to use a cat as a running example in this, in this presentation. So, you know, cats are cool. I don't hate cats at all. Okay, so loosely speaking, there are about three parts to this presentation. The first part, I will introduce what CLIP is. Then I'll dive a bit into the methodology and I'll finish up with discussing the experiments and results. The authors also do something kind of cool where they discuss the limitations and broader impacts of their work as well. So we'll take a little dive into that as well. Okay, so first of all, what is CLIP? And before I even start explaining what it is, I just want to show you some results for it. And hopefully that can give you guys some intuition behind what's, what's to come. So these are all different data sets. So this is just a random sample that I just uh, screenshotted from the paper. So we have a facial emotion recognition data set, Stanford cars, ImageNet v2, CIFAR 100, and so forth. And what we're essentially doing is classifying the photo on the left. So here we'll just run with this CIFAR example, just because that's probably the most common. So this is a, a very blurry picture of a snake, but it's still a snake. And if the model has made the right prediction, the bar will be in green. So every bar where there's green uh, means that it's the right prediction that's made. Now, if we actually take a look at the label, we, we, in typical image classification, we expect to just see the label, right? We expect to just see snake or uh, roundabout in this particular case here, or maybe beer bottle or, or kangaroo, but we're seeing something slightly different here. We're seeing a photo of a snake or a photo of a happy looking face or satellite imagery of a roundabout. And this is actually uh, something which CLIP intentionally does. And I'll talk about why that is, but at a high level, CLIP is an image classifier, which was, which uses contrastive training to predict which caption goes with which image. Importantly, it's a zero shot classifier as well. And if you haven't been introduced to, to zero shot learning yet, there's a, there's a slide coming up on that. So uh, you can get a, a bit of a definition about what it's actually doing. It beats fully supervised baselines, sometimes by a huge margin on many, many data sets. And while its approach isn't entirely novel, it's never been done at this scale or efficiency before, or with the, the amount of experiments that these guys actually do. Now, CLIP is actually a, it's a 47 page paper. So I probably won't have time to cover absolutely every result that they get. I've tried to extract out the, the ones which I think are important and, you know, particularly useful for, for you guys as well. So what is the motivation? Well, in existing image classification models, we tend to have a fixed number of labels. And also the, the models that we have, they don't tend to general, generalize well at all outside of the domain of their training. And I have some examples coming up in this in the experiment section, but for now, just take it as a given. And CLIP is a model which attempts to overcome these limitations. So we, we kind of start our thought process from image captioning, which is we have a, a image of a cat wearing sunglasses. We feed it into a model and out comes our caption. Now from image captioning, this is basically, you know, like a, a cross entropy or a, basically a sequence classification objective. And importantly, what a, a common practice that we can do is take the, the last fully connected layer or one of the last layers from the model and use this as a, as an image representation. So this is kind of like a, a latent feature of the image. But we can also do something else, which I haven't really seen too, too much in mainstream work, but it, it has existed. And that is we can use our network to identify the, the probability of an arbitrary label. So first of all, note that CLIP isn't trained on image 
label pairs, it's trained on image caption pairs. So the way that they collected their data was, you know, they got a, a web scraper, they found some images, maybe through social media or something like that. Just imagine like an Instagram image with the, with the, the caption that the, uh, the poster posted. Anyway, yeah, using, using our network or, or rather more typically using our, our, our image features here, what we can do is identify the probability of an arbitrary label. So here we have bear, cat and dog, and these are encoded by a text encoder and uh, we can do some kind of operation with the image features that outputs a likelihood or probability score for each of the labels. And we can actually do this on the caption level as well. So instead of just feeding in one word like bear or cat, what we could do is we can feed in a photo of a bear or a photo of a cat and also get a, a probability score for each one of the captions that we fed in. So uh, I just wanna give some, some definitions here and then I can talk more about how this is similar to what Clip is trying to do, but this is just to prime you with some, some intuition of what's to come. So uh, there's two things here, which some of you guys might not have had uh, fair exposure to, and that is contrastive learning and zero shot learning. Now in contrastive learning, well, when we compare contrastive to typical classification or prediction problems, what these kinds of problems do is that we have a network which outputs one label, which we want to optimize against. Whereas in contrastive learning, we're given n plus one samples where n samples are negative and one samples are positive. And we want to optimize the network to, high, to assign a higher probability to the one positive sample as opposed to the n negative samples. Zero shot learning is typically used to refer to training on, on one data set and then generalizing the model to unseen object categories. As you can expect, it's, it's a very hard task to do. And before CLIP, I, I don't think any of the zero shot classifiers were, were competitive in their results. CLIP slightly defines or slightly redefines zero shot and their redefinition is to measure the task learning capabilities of a machine learning system. And basically this just means how well can a, a pre-trained model generalize to other data sets. So not to another image, but to another data set. And contrastive learning works really well. So this is, this is a result from, from, from the clip paper. What they did, uh, what they do, they have a transformer language model, a bag of words model, and a bag of words trained in a contrastive fashion, which is their clip model. So with the transformer language model, what we, what we try to do is predict the ground truth caption. So we feed in an image to a model and we want the, the model to output a caption in, in the co correct uh, sequential order. Bag of words, on the other hand, is more of a multi-label classification problem where we don't really care about the sequence order. We just care about whether this word appears in the, in the ground truth sentence or not. Now, both of these approaches need to predict the exact words for a text for each image. And this, you know, as we've seen from previous research is somewhat of a difficult task. The bag of words clip model, the contrastive model, on the other hand, what this does is it tries to predict which text as a whole is likely paired with which image. And I can, I'll show you what that means here in a second. By the way, guys, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. I, I like the, the dynamic format. It makes it uh, a lot more fun for the speaker as well to, to have questions asked. Okay, so that was kind of a rough introduction and hopefully after we discuss the methodology in a bit more detail, all the, all the pieces uh, of the circle can be tied together. So let's talk about the actual model of CLIP. We have three steps here. So we'll, we'll start from step one and we have one batch. So this is, this is paired data. This, this image here is Pepper the Aussie pup. And this second piece of text here is, is aligned with, with this image here. What we're doing is we're encoding each one of the texts that we have, and we get a, some kind of representation for each one of the texts that we have. So T1 refers to Pepper the Aussie pup and image one refers to the image encoding of this image here. Now, this is where we do the contrastive pre-training. So along our diagonal here, what we see is that image one and text one should be, i1.t1 should be, is, is our positive sample. Whereas in the horizontal direction and the vertical direction, we have our negative samples. 
So actually clip is trained asymmetrically. So what we will do is we'll work out the loss this way. So we'll say, okay, how does this image compare to, to all the texts in our batch? So we have a loss going this way and we also have a loss vertically as well. So obviously in the horizontal direction, well, I guess in both directions, we want to optimize the diagonal of this matrix. We want to push all of these purple values up to one and everything else down to zero. Now, going back to this slide here, this is the creating the data classifier from the label text. So this is, this is the pre-training aspect. And now we have the, uh, the actual classification, which is going on here. So what we're doing is we have a list of labels. Okay. As we can see, plain card dog. And we also have a prompt and I'll talk more about prompts in a second, but for now, I'll just say what we're going to do is instead of just feeding plane into the text encoder or car into the text encoder, we're going to say a photo of a plane or a photo of a car. These get encoded by the, by the text encoder. And we have our image, which is coming in. It's encoded by the image encoder. And all we do is we do a dot product. This is literally just a cosine distance um, between the image and all of the text features. And the one which is the highest is going to be our prediction. And here, a photo of a dog. <clears throat> okay, so some training details. Existing data sets are small, and I say small in, in inverted commas or quotes because, you know, a couple of years ago, 100,000 was considered quite big. Whereas now we're working more with data sets on the side in, in, in the order of the magnitudes of millions or tens of millions or even hundreds of millions. So the authors consider three data sets, that is Visual Genome and MS Coco, both of which are about 100,000 images in size, and also YFCC 100 million. However, after doing some uh, exploratory analysis on this, they find that like high quality images, i.e. those with English captions and some other attributes that they choose, they only managed to narrow this down to about 15 million pairs. I say only, that's still a huge amount. Anyway, so, sorry. What the, okay. So the authors, they construct a, a 400 million paired data set from a variety of publicly available sources. So this could be social media, maybe Flickr as well, maybe some other image websites. And we have image text pairs. They found that they, they really didn't need to augment their data to achieve the results that they, that, that they got. Only, they, the only thing they did was use a random square crop in the, in the image. There was no color jittering or random flipping or anything like that in term for the images or for the text. They have a temperature parameter, which when we look into the formula a little bit, typically this is a hyperparameter, but this, the, the authors, they just decided to, to tune this automatically using, using a neural network, I guess. And importantly, the image encoder from from this here. So the image encoder will either be a ResNet or a vision transformer. And the text encoder is going to be a typical transformer. They use the EOS token as the, as the text feature. So obviously uh, typically with a transformer, when we encode something, we'll get something which is sequence length times dimensionality. But if we want just one feature to represent the whole, the whole sequence, what's common practice is either we can use the CLS or the start of sequence token or the end of sequence token to, to encode like the, the, the holistic meaning of the, of the sentence or the sequence rather. So I, I spoke a little bit about prompts when we saw a, uh, a photo of an object. And this is because of a, a newly evolving field known as prompt engineering and the release of GPT kind of encouraged or, or kind of develop this field more and that prompt engineering is like what do i need to tell a model as in what language input do i need to specify a model for it to do what i want the authors found that specifying a photo of a dog or a cat or a plane instead of just dog cat or plane led to a 1.3 percent increase in their performance or in in their metric in their accuracy i guess just by just by including the the a photo of a for more domain specific tasks, such as the, the Oxford pets data set, which attempts to classify pets into like 
their actual breed, so like an Alsatian or a Maine Coon cat, slightly more specific prompts worked well. So they would say, for example, a photo of a label, a type of pet. Ensembling prompts was something else that they found which worked well as well. So by this, I mean, they would say, sorry. So when I say ensembling, what I mean is that they use multiple prompts. So they had a photo of a big label and a photo of a small label. Now, the way the ensemble was actually done was that they ensembled over the embedding space as opposed to the probability space. So what this means is that here we would have a photo of a, a big plane or a photo of a small plane, and we would encode them both, okay? So we have our, our one label and we have our multiple prompts. And each one of these prompts is, is encoded with the, with the respective label. So we would have an encoding of a photo of a big plane and a photo of a small plane. And then we just average that vector. And this was the, the ensemble embedding that we used. They found that by using 80 different context prompts, that the performance increased by three and a half percent. So with the prompt and the ensembling, there was almost a 5% evaluation increase just by using these two simple tricks, which I found pretty crazy. And uh, this is a graph which shows along with the, the, the point improvement that we're getting, we're also getting a four times efficiency gain to reach the same level of improvement for by using prompts and ensembles. So uh, on the x-axis, we have the, the gigaflops, so the, the floating point operations per second. And we can see that when we have contextless class names, i.e. just plain cat, dog, mouse, whatever else, it takes a lot more compute to achieve the same level of score. And the authors, they really weren't lying about how simple this model is. Like the diagram you saw, that's about as genuinely simple as this model is. So this is some pseudocode that the authors provide. So I'm just gonna run through this quite quickly. We have an image encoder and a text encoder. We have a batch of images with their aligned text. So N is batch size, height with channel, and N is batch size, obviously, and L is the length of the text. We have some, or we have two projection layers. So these would just be like feed forward layers or something, linear layers, shape image dimensionality to embedding dimensionality, and the, the text layer to be the text dimensionality to embedding dimensionality and T, which is just a temperature parameter that they learn. So what we do is uh, we extract out the image features and the text features from our image encoder and text encoder. And then we fuse the two together. So we have the image features with the, sorry, the fusion isn't going on here. What we're doing here is we're learning a multimodal embedding space. So we, we have the image features and we're embedding them into a shared embedding space with WI. And we're doing the same with the text features as well. And then we work out the cosine similarities between the image embedding and the text embedding. And then we scale that by our temperature. And then all we're doing is we're working out the loss in the horizontal direction. So this is the loss for the images and then the loss for the text in the other direction. So one is on axis zero and the other is on axis one. And then finally, our overall loss just becomes the average of the, the image loss and the text loss as well. And that's it. That's literally the whole model. So let's talk a bit about the experiments. I'm just going to turn the light on. But I saw some questions coming through. So let me, let me uh, see if they actually were questions or just comments. Yes. So Joe asked in, in the zero shot setting, are the pictures different from those used in the pre-training? Yes, they are. So they, they pre-train on this 400 million corpus that they collect and then for each of the data sets, they, this is what they're, they're testing their zero shot against. So the labels slash objects, where do they come from? So for a specific data set, we, we have the labels, which this data set has. So for example, CIFAR would have labels for animals and all we're doing is we're, we're taking all of these labels and with, we're encoding them each into a photo of an object and then sending that to the text encoder. Can I ask one more question? Sure. So I'm really interested by the difference in like saying a 
photo of a cat versus just putting in the word cat. Like that's like really interesting. Mm -hmm. What's your intuition behind why that's the case? So when, when you go on Instagram, for example, you don't ever see somebody posting their cat and just labeling it as cat. You typically see like, this is my cat, or I got a new cat whose name is John, for example. So I think the fact that you have this general prompt, there's probably so much data where this, this kind of an image of, or a photo of some object actually exists as opposed to just, you know, the, the raw label in, in, in isolation as a caption for an image. So I think there's just some, some hidden representations, which are, which are a bit more effective, I guess is the only way that I can phrase it when, yeah, when, when you actually have a prompt as opposed to just an individual label. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Can I ask another question? Yeah, so sure. Is, are all of the captions that are generated, are they all going to look like this, a photo of, and then an object that is predicted to be an image? So a lot of the time it's tuned to the data set. So if we go back to uh, the first slide, we can see for this data set, which I imagine is satellite imagery, just by looking at the prompts, they, they initialize the prompt as satellite imagery of, and then they ask the model, like, which one of these labels do you think is more likely? So uh, the same with the pets here as well, where they say comma, a type of pet. But, but the prompt in the pet is just a photo of, right? The, no, it's, the... it's a photo of something, a type of pet. So essentially what they're doing is detecting the main object in the picture and filling yeah. up that slot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's sort of an image classification task. Yeah, it is a, it is a image classifier. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I didn't get it. And they're just using sort of the ca captioning as sort of a way to get to this. By yeah, they, it as a captioning. yeah. They found that when they inputted a caption, as opposed to just here, throw me a, return me a label. And, and it, when it's more like here, return me a whole caption in its context that the, the performance significantly increased. Okay. May I also ask a question? You mentioned that they pre-train on millions of images, mm -hmm. but can we really speak of viewership learning if they use, I don't know, how many million images for pre-training and then they use another set of images for like, I don't know, for testing or for fine-tuning, whatever they do with that second set, because probably everything or a lot of stuff is already in the pre-trained images available, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the authors actually put that as one of their limitations that the, there isn't like true generalization going on here. More of what it is is because of the huge amount of training data that there's probably some like positive bias, which the model has, has now learned. So that is definitely a valid criticism that like it's not efficient. And that's one of the points that I make later on that like, oh, oh we'll get to that. But yeah, you're, you're completely right. The fact that it is trained on on so much data does mean that it has been exposed to, to a lot of these kinds of concepts before. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk a bit about the, the experiments, the results, the limitations, and the broader impacts of their work. So this is zero shot clip, zero shot versus ResNet 50. And ResNet 50 is it's not state of the art anymore, but it's still a very popular baseline in image classification literature. So, you know, just looking at this is, is kind of interesting just as in a baseline and we can look at more state of the art image, image classification models in a couple of slides. So we have a ResNet, which was trained on or pre-trained on ImageNet and linearly probed to, to each data set. And if you haven't come across the, the term linear probing before, just think of this like fine tuning, apart from the, the base model, its weights are fixed and you're not tuning them in parallel. So you, you have frozen weights of the base model and you're just attaching a, a linear layer at the, after the, the, the fully classified, the, the fully classification, the last FC layer of the, the ResNet model. And this linear layer was tuned for each data set. So basically they just take ResNet features and they tune, uh, tune a layer for, for each specific data set. So we have STL10, Stanford cars, blah, 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 all the way down to uh, Eurosat. And what we're measuring here is, is zero, zero shot clip versus a linear probe on ResNet. 
and we're looking at the performance difference. So the ones in green are where zero shot clip outperforms ResNet. So this is a fine tuned ResNet and we have a zero shot learner outperforming ResNet by sometimes a margin of over 30%. And actually this STL10, this is a, this is a new state of the art for, for this data set, getting 99.3% accuracy. Zero shot clip wins on 16 out of the 27 data sets that they were tested on. But the, the, the general observation here is that specialized data sets perform worse with clip. And by that, I mean Patch Chameleon, for example, and, and Eurosat. Now, Patch Chameleon is a tumor detection data set, I believe. You get given an image of a, a cancer and you have to say whether it's benign or, or uh, malignant. And when we have these more specialized tasks where the data hasn't, you know, you wouldn't expect to see this data with, with a similar context out in the wild. This is where Clip performs significantly worse than, than, than ResNet. Interestingly, MNIST, which is obviously considered like the hello world of machine learning, has a 10% performance de decrease on, on, on Clip as well. Could one of you maybe provide some intuition why that could be the case? Or why, why do you think it would perform worse on MNIST? Maybe because it hasn't been pre-trained on images that look like MNIST numbers. Yeah, exactly. Like when I look at images online, I, I see a lot of written text and, and pictures of, of things which are text, but never really any handwriting. So this is one of the things the authors allude to that perhaps because there isn't a large amount of handwritten data in, in the data set, that even when doing something as trivial as MNIST, it performs well. Whereas I think there's probably like a, a sign data set here somewhere where, where like, where it's digitalized text, like a picture of a, a road name or something like that, where, where it performs better than, than, than ResNet. Do you mind saying again, where the training, where the pre-training data comes from? For Clip? Yeah. They, they literally set a variety of public sources. Okay. Cool. Okay, so here we have a graph of zero shot clip versus few shot linear probes. And in the few shot setup, we, we use image features to train a linear classifier on top of that. And we restrict the number of labeled examples for, for a particular class. So uh, just to expand on that a little bit, what we're doing is we're taking the, the BYTM model, the SimClear model and, and the ResNet model and we're, we're saying, okay, you're only allowed to see one, two, four, eight, or 16 of the, the images, which we have in our, in our test set. And we're going to assess your few shot learning performance by, you know, based on the amount of times you've seen this example in the training class, in, in the training set. And what we see is that zero shot clip matches the, the performance of the state of a state of the art 16 shot image classifier in a zero shot setting. Zero shot clip also outperforms few shot clip, which is very interesting, right? How come zero shot clip is performing better than, than a few shot clip? So basically what they did here was they, and, and sorry, that result seems kind of interesting, but just recall what, what a probe is doing is changing the, or, or there's an important distinction between a zero shot setting and a few shot setting. So firstly, like clips zero shot classifier is generated by, by natural language, which allows for visual con visual concepts to like be directly specified or communicated to the model. Whereas with normal supervised learning, we need to infer concepts indirectly from, from training examples. So contextless example-based learning, like the, the typical, the typical image classification setup has the, has the drawback that many different hypotheses can be consistent with the data, especially in, in the one shot case, right? You have an arbitrary image and you have only one labeled example of what, what this, what this, what the main object in the feet in the image actually is, but the image might contain multiple objects. So. Although, you know, we can typically associate that there would be a trend with the, 
the primary object in the image being a label, being the, the right label, this isn't necessarily or always the case. Another result is that the, the data efficiency of zero shot clip varies heavily. So this is a graph comparing zero shot clip to few shot clip. And what I mean by this is the numbers that you see here are estimations of how many examples a linearly probed clip would have to see to achieve the same results as a, as a zero shot clip. So the, the performance varies widely and it still underperforms on, on two data sets. So the Eurosat and the Flowers 102, but also it severely overperforms on, on the few shot case in, in like FER 2013, where we would need approximately 184 labels to per, per class to, to match the performance of zero shot clip. And clip is um, a fantastic classifier. This is actually the, the, the linear probe clip. So where we see the, the stars here, th these refer to clip models. The, the, the empty stars are with the, the ResNet and the field stars are with the, the vision transformer. The, the current state of the art for image classification is the efficient net noisy student. And we can see that linearly probed clip actually outperform the, the, the state of the art. So this isn't, this image here isn't a zero shot setting. This is a, a few shot setting. But, but yeah, what we can take away is that the, how a clip was trained and its feature space is actually really, really high quality. And it's also robust. So this is comparing clip to zero shot clip to, to ResNet. And typical computer vision systems aren't very robust. And what I mean by this is, is that we have ImageNet, a, a data set of ImageNet here, and another data set called ImageNet V2, which is basically attempting to, to replicate the distribution of ImageNet for a particular class as accurately as possible. We can see when we test ResNet on, on the ImageNet data set, we get 76.2% uh, uh, accuracy, whereas there's almost a temp, an over 10% performance decrease when tested on ImageNet V2. And as we can see, as the, the, the data sets get, you know, slightly more abstract in the terms of the sketch cases or even the adversarial case, the performance just completely diminishes in, in, in the ResNet model. So uh, ImageNet A is, is an adversarial data set. So yeah, while it's pretty tricky, while it's pretty mean, you know, a human would still be able to say, yeah, this is, uh, this is a banana and this is, it, it has a banana in there as well. Zero shot clip, on the other hand, as we can see, we can look at the, the, the delta scores here. We can see that at minimum it's getting 60%, but there really isn't any performance decrease or like overly serious performance decrease when, when switching between data sets. But obviously a, a reason for this could be the, the large amount of data that um, clip was trained on. Looking at the, the graph on the left, if we were to take a model which had a 80% top one accuracy on ImageNet, for all those standard ImageNet models, you would have a very low accuracy on a, on a data set with a slight distribution shift, which is uh, what this, this y-axis is representing. So something which achieved 80% on ImageNet would probably get about 30% on, on the, the, or average 30% on the data sets with uh, slightly different distributions. Whereas with clip, we can see that the performance is a lot higher when considering different distributions. This, this dash line here is, is Y equals X. And this is kind of the ideal setting that we want to hit where, you know, if we get 85% on ImageNet, then we also want to get 85% on, on data sets, which have a, a slight distribution shift as well. So we're not there yet, but we can see that clip is an absolute massive improvement towards that. And as I already mentioned, Clip has a, uh, a very high quality feature space. The, the main thing to take away from this slide is that if you adapt to ImageNet, and by this, I mean, like if you do a, um, a linear regression or sorry, a logistic regression or, or, a, or a linear probe on, on Clip towards, towards ImageNet. So this is a uh, zero shot Clip here in the orange, and this is a, a logistic regression or a probed version of Clip, which has been fine tuned to ImageNet. We can get a 9.2% performance increase. However, probing, ImageNet, probing to ImageNet decreases the performance very slightly 
on some other slightly distorted data sets. So we can see it's gone down, but it's gone down marginally compared to, to the improvement that we've got by fine tuning it to ImageNet. In terms of class shift, in, in zero shot models, labels that the data set assigns as, as ground truth might not have existed during, during training time. So there have been some previous works which attempted to handle this by pooling over the, the subclasses of ImageNet for, for a given label. So for example, YouTube BB, which is a, a video data set, I guess they just use a frame for, for image classification, but there's a person class which exists on YouTube BB and the way that, or, or the, the traditional, I say traditional is only last year, but uh, you know, the, the older way of doing this was that we would pull over the image net classes for baseball player, bridegroom and scuba diver. And because in the image net hierarchy, these are all a, a subset of a person, we would then say that this, this prediction is this person. And obviously the setup has, has a lot of flaws. Clip, however, doesn't suffer from this problem because it has, it, it's flexible because of its natural language supervision. And we can adapt the class labels at test time to the class labels of any given data set because it's been trained on natural language. On average, this increases the score by about 5%. But there, there is some large variation between the data sets where, where this methodology is adapted. And we can see here that, you know, on YouTube BB, we actually get a 27% performance increase. And the authors acknowledge that th this, this improvement with, with class shifts only seems to be concentrated on, on a few data sets. How does clip fare versus humans? So the setup that they considered was the Oxford IIT pets data set. And as I mentioned previously, this is a data set which has the actual breeds slash species of the pet. So it's not just dog or cat, it's like Alsatian or Maine Coon, for example. And what they did was they asked a human to classify an image into its class in a zero shot setting and a one shot setting. And humans, they see a massive, massive increase between the zero shot setting and the one shot setting. And I'm just gonna point over to this, to the X axis here, because there are some breeds of pets, which I just haven't heard of before. So, you know, before I looked at this, I was like, oh, this is probably an easy task. But then I was like, you know, I've never heard of uh, a Russian blue dog before, for example, or maybe that's a cat, I'm not entirely sure. But in the one shot setting, what they did was they showed a human one, one example of this species or this breed of pet and then they asked a the human to, to classify a bunch of images and they saw a 22% a performance increase when they had the, the one shot setup as opposed to the zero shot setup. Clip, however, doesn't do so well. I'm going from zero to one shot as we saw in, in one of the previous slides, there was actually a performance decrease when we did that. So this implies that there, there is a difference between how humans learn from examples and how Clip learns from examples as well. Okay, let's talk about some limitations and, and, and some broader impacts of their work. So zero shot clip is competitive with ResNet, okay? But ResNet is far from state of the art as we, we saw on, on this image here. ResNet is all the way down here, whereas we have this efficient, efficient net noisy student, which is basically the current state of the art. So zero shot clip is competitive with ResNet, but it's not competitive with efficient net. The authors estimate that there's that there needs to be about a 1,000 times increase in, in compute for, for zero shot clip to, to match the current state of the art. And uh, they also acknowledge that clip has poor generalization to true out of domain tasks. And clip does very little to actually address this generalization, but rather attempts to circumvent it by just throwing a huge amount of training data at it. Joe, sorry, do you have a question? Yes. So, I mean, that's really interesting. So I'm wondering, like, how does that compare to other models like ResNet? So if you trained ResNet on a load of other domains and then tested it on MNIST, would you see the same fall in, in generalization or would it kind of generalize kind of better I, or worse? I think you definitely would see a fall in generalization just mm -hmm. based on um, this, this slide here. So it was trained on ImageNet and even when you compare it to ImageNet v2, you're seeing over 10% uh, performance decrease. Okay, they, they don't compare it in the paper at all. Like a ResNet trained on MNIST. I guess what I'm trying to try and wonder is how, so I, 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 it's a really nice point you made about how, you know, it, when it's true out of domain, the performance will drop a lot. I'm just wondering how that compares to other models. I think other models, they're, they're just not robust at all. So like when you, 
you know, you can fine tune these, these models and there, there will be a performance increase, but it's specific to, to the data set that it was fine tuned on. You, you then couldn't use that classifier for, for a different, for a different data set where the point with clip is that obviously you can. Another limitation that they discuss is that clip is extremely expensive. What they say from the paper is, is that if every image during training clip was presented at a rate of one image per second, it would take over 405 years to iterate through the, the 12.8 billion images. So they definitely acknowledge that, you know, what uh, potentially what they're doing is just throwing a huge amount of data at this problem. And, and that's why it's working. Okay. As far as broader impacts go, they, they discuss a couple of things, but one, one particular thing, which I found quite interesting was this discussion about Fairface. And Fairface is a, a data set which consists of faces from faces of people from, from seven different races across two genders. And while the authors acknowledge that we can't reduce race and gender into these small label sets, they're just purely doing it here for a comparison or a comparative purpose. So in addition to, to the Fairface classes that they have, which would obviously be the race of the individual and the gender of the individual, they have four non-human classes and three crime-related classes. So um, the non-human classes are animal, gorilla, chimpanzee, and orangutan, probably referencing that mistake that Google's classifier made a couple of years ago. And the, the crime-related classes are thief, criminal, and suspicious person. And here, this is just a, a random sample from, from the Fairface data set. So what the authors find, so up here we have, yeah, People from which gender got, got classified into either a crime related category or a non-human category. So about 5% of the images, like if you, if you take an average, were classified as a, as a non-human class. Um, and, and black had the, the highest misclassification rate at about 14 and a half percent. For the crime related categories, what they found is, is not shown on this, in this table. This table shows both males and females, but they found that a significantly large, larger portion of males were misclassified to be one of these crime related classes, as opposed to females. So about 16 and a half percent of, of males were, were misclassified as either thief, suspicious person or criminal, whereas about nine, uh, about 9.8% of, or about 10% of females were, were misclassified into one of these crime related classes. Interestingly, interestingly, they also found that people that were aged between zero and 20 were more likely to fall under the crime related classes. So and we can see that here. So the, the percentages for, for young childs, young children are, are really, really high when it comes to being misclassified into a crime related category. And the authors found that when they added a child category, we can, we can see how severely these, uh, these misclassifications dropped. And the authors really emphasize how important label and class engineering actually is when, when designing and, and um, measuring performance of models as well. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for listening. I appreciate the guys who asked questions during the presentation, but obviously if you have any more questions, please feel free to shout. Hi. <clears throat> I've got, I've got one. Thanks a lot for the presentation. I thought it was thought it was really good. Really good uh, overview of the paper. I mean, just generally, have they released uh, their code or in, an implementation? Yeah, their their code is all open source. I think they've released a small pre-trained model, not not maybe not one trained on the whole data set, which you can uh, use and tap into. Actually, I can I can bring up the code here. Open AI. That was going to be my follow-up question. What, what did did you mention? What size their model is? How, how big it is and how it compares in size to the other ones, the ResNet, et cetera. S sorry, could you repeat the question? How big? Have, have, did they mention how large their model is? How many, how many parameters? How does it compare to the mm -hmm. other models which it was being benchmarked against? The one against the small model or the big model? Well, whichever one they really report all their results for, I guess that would be the large one, right? Yeah, that would be the large one. They, they do talk about their their setup. So give me a second. Maybe I can find that. I can't remember it off the top of my head. Here we go. Okay. No, I don't think they mentioned the number of parameters, although they, they do say like what it took to, to train their model. So their ResNet model, as in the one which has the ResNet backbone took 18 days on 592 V 100s. So obviously a huge amount of compute, which leads me to believe that it was significantly bigger than, well, maybe not right. If this is the, the number the of parameters, we'll probably say below, the same, is it, is right? It's, less. Sorry. It's just saying below the vision transformer is quite a lot less. It's quite interesting. 
Yeah, this is something that I think the, the authors of the Vision Transformer reported as well. The, the Transformer is faster than CNNs at, at large scale. But kind of this just got me thinking that I think the number of parameters is actually the same. The reason that it took so long to train was just because of the amount of data that they actually had. So they're using like a standard ResNet 50 backbone here. So I think the, and a, and a relatively decent sized transformer, it's not a big transformer, but just like maybe eight layers or something like that. So I think the, the models themselves are normal sized, but the reason it took so long to train and why we had to throw so much compute at it was because of how much data that, that the authors had on hand. Okay. Well, I mean, that's cool, I guess, because I if and when they fully release, you know, it will fit on our machines. We can actually have a go with it rather than it being ridiculously big. But yeah, okay, cheers. I have a question. So Joe's question about the pre-training data got me thinking that if they say that they trained it on publicly available data, doesn't that mean that they kind of, they could have just included all these data sets in their training data? Would, would you not include something like ImageNet if you were I... trying to build a good training set? I don't think so. I think a variety of public sources kind of implies that they were, I think it's a, a legitimate concern and I didn't actually pick up on anything where they discussed that potential limitation, but my intuition is that they, you know, they, they were just scraping image Instagram and, and Facebook and I don't know, maybe Twitter or something like that, as opposed to actually like downloading publicly available data sets and augmenting their, uh, or adding that data into their data set. Um, okay. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's definitely a, a valid point, which I don't remember reading in the paper. I, I don't remember them talking about that in the paper. I may have missed, like, did that during pre-training, do they use the parallel data or, or do, can they work with just, I mean, <laughs> that, that kind of limits it if they need, uh, images paired with text. So there's, I don't know, it's not that easy to get good like massive amounts of image captioning data, basically. I don't think it's like necessarily like a caption in its true sense. I think it's more like a comment which goes along with the image. So for example, I would say like there's definitely more than 400 million publicly available posts on Instagram. And I mean, yeah, the, the, the text that you have there that the, the author or the poster posts with the image, that's not necessarily a caption, but it, you know, it could be like some very weak or noisy description of, of the the contents of the image okay i mean i would be very interested to know and i think they should kind of reveal well where, where they got the training data from otherwise it's kind of weird but they are also saying a little bit about some filtering on that data though let me what section is this section 2.2 so they talk about trying to sanitize that a little bit by, you know, tr trying to not include absolutely crazy visual concepts there. So when we're, when they're creating that image text tuple, they do say we search for image text pairs as part of the construction process whose text includes one of a set of 500,000 queries. So I think it's kind of striking a good balance between you know, internet data per se, which gives it the scale and the increasing the in-domain part of the data, but at the same time also not getting into really crazy images or really crazy image captions. Yeah, I think there's, there's some filtering process going on, but I don't think you can like manually verify, you know, whether the, the image text or whether the text necessarily describes the whole content of the image. I think there would be like in the training data, a lot of, yeah, image and text pairs, which, you know, if, if you ask a human to caption it, they would come up with something completely different, right? This is like, if I took a picture of a dinner, I'd be like at a restaurant, I could be, yeah, night out with my friend, for example. Whereas if you ask, whereas the caption of this, this actual image would be a plate on a table, which with pasta in it. Oh, yes, 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 definitely. I mean, I don't think the the text descriptions themselves have been sanitized in any way, but... Uh... Yeah, I think the, the data set as a whole has been sanitized, but I don't... I, I think it's wrong to call it a caption. I'm just calling it a caption because there's a, a, a lack of a better word for it. Text, I guess. Cool. Okay, guys, we're, we're over five o'clock now, so yeah, we should call it.
thank you very much for for coming to to this talk and hope to see you guys next week i think ozan is going to be presenting a paper that he published at coling last year thanks a lot okay. thanks thank you guys bye thank you bye. thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you.